Greetings, my fellow renegades. Today I'm going to talk about mold, my nemesis. It took me a long time to figure out that mold exposure was the main contributor to my chronic illness. So what chronic illness did I have? You might be wondering. Well, it manifested in three different ways. One was severe full body eczema, two was severe nasal allergies, and three was gastrointestinal uh, difficulties like IBS. I don't know if any of you have dealt with severe eczema before, but it is not what most people think. I think most people think of eczema as kind of an annoying cosmetic issue. But when, you, when eczema gets to a certain level, it is like pure torture. Your skin is constantly on fire. So it is really a physical discomfort issue. It's like chronic pain. So this prevents you from wanting to socialize with people. It prevents you from sleeping. There was a period where my eczema was really bad where I just like slept like a, a few hours a night, just itching and, oh. Uh, and eczema also causes depression, anxiety. You might think you can imagine what severe itching is if you've had like poison ivy or something, but that never lasts longer than a couple weeks. When your severe itching lasts years on end, it really, really wears on you. Not to mention the fact that I felt like my whole body was just becoming more and more inflamed like before my eyes and it was cracking and bleeding. I felt like the eczema was just like eating me almost. Like when is it gonna stop? The only thing that really worked in a long-term way to control my eczema was eating a fairly radical diet, a very, very clean diet. And once I started to work with doctors who could actually treat my mold illness, then I started to be able to expand my diet again. I still have to be really careful with what I eat. I can't eat anything processed. I have to avoid gluten and dairy, stuff like that. I'll probably do a future video on my diet. Anyway, back to my symptoms. The nasal allergy symptoms manifested like this. I basically could not stop sneezing and having my, my nasal mucosa just itch constantly. And this also is torturous. You cannot, uh, imagine if you were constantly on the verge of sneezing. You know that feeling where you're like, imagine if you had that feeling indefinitely. You can't get anything done. You can't think about anything but how uncomfortable you are. And as far as the IBS, that was mainly like a nutrient absorption issue and I lost a lot of weight. There was a point where I was like 118 pounds and I'm like 5'8", five, 5'9", five, so that's, not optimal. Since starting to treat my mold illness, I've gained like 20 pounds. You can actually see for yourself how sick I was if you look at my earlier videos. I have like eczema around my eyes, you can see that. And I feel, I look obviously a lot better now if you compare. The reason my mold exposure was so severe is because in a house I used to live, a sewage leak had been slowly saturating the drywall long before I even moved in there. So I did air sampling and my air tested positive for stachybotrys, which is a very toxigenic mold species and it usually doesn't even show up in air samples. That's how bad this was. So I was exposed to quite a bit of that from just living there and also because I helped remediate the issue myself, and I wouldn't have done that if I had known the risks. Right after that, I got sicker than I had ever been. So looking back at the past 10 years that I've been sick, I retrospectively have realized I've lived in a lot of places with water damage and mold. The really terrible mold exposure was somewhat more recent, and I got so much worse after that exposure that that kind of tipped me off of like, oh, maybe this is mold, and maybe it has been mold all along. I don't want anyone to have to wait as long as I did to figure out why they're sick. It's not like I didn't go to a lot of doctors. I went to tons of doctors. I went to Western doctors. I went to naturopaths. Well, first I went to just like regular primary care physicians. Then, you know, we're talking acupuncturists. We're talking dermatologists. We're talking nutritionists, herbalists, intuitive healers. So naturopathic and allopathic alike and nobody linked my symptoms to the underlying cause of my illness. To illustrate how much of a problem this is, I'm gonna tell you something that you, I promise, will never forget. This is a quote by leading air quality expert, Michael Rubino. We breathe around 20,000 breaths every single day. That's enough to fill a swimming pool, roughly 2,000 gallons. We also spend 90% of our time indoors, so air is quite literally one of the most significant exposures we have, and yet we rarely consider it in holistic wellness. 
I've noticed that a lot of Western doctors especially seem to think that mold causing illness is some sort of like far-fetched fringe theory, but if they actually read the scientific literature, they would see that it's extremely well established. They would clearly see that there have been numerous epidemiological studies and analyses done by credible organizations, the World Health Organization, Institute of Medicine, and the CDC. And these studies show that indoor dampness or mold are consistently associated with many diseases from eczema, which is what I had, asthma, nasal allergies, again what I had, bronchitis, and respiratory infections. As you continue to watch this video, it'll become clear that more than just those illnesses can be caused by mold. As a scientist myself, I will tell you, the evidence is there. And for the record, I don't even blame individual doctors because they're just a part of this broken system and they're most of them are doing the best they can and they're really busy. But the fact is, the medical field is leaving so many of us high and dry. Eventually, after a really long period of suffering, too long, I made the connection myself with the help of my fiance, Rachel. From there, I sought out treatment from doctors who actually know how to treat mold illness. This was around seven months ago. Since then, I've gotten better way faster than I have from like eight years of trying the other stuff. So I'm beyond relieved. Relief is my primary emotion. And I'm still healing, of course. I've been sick for a very long time, and so it's gonna take more than you know half a year to heal. So the main reason why I'm posting this video is because it contains a discussion that I had with an expert on mold. And in the discussion, we talk about how there's so much scientific evidence linking mold to illness, many different chronic illnesses. Full disclosure, part of this interview is in a previous video I did about humidification, but this video contains an extended version of the interview. David Fontaine, a systems engineer who is chair of the Scientific Outreach Committee at Change the Air Foundation, will now share some information with us. Yeah, thanks, Alex. For starters, I'd like to make it clear that toxin-producing molds really aren't unicorns they're common. In fact, they're kind of the natural end state, if you think about it, as mold toxins or mycotoxins, as they're more technically called, are, are used for a competitive advantage, meaning the longer water damage is present, the more likely toxigenic molds are to come to dominate in the environment. This really isn't conjecture. It's very clear if you look at the mold prevalence data from HUD's American Healthy Home Survey, um, this was a study, the most recent one in 2019, it was a study of 700 homes from across the country that were selected as being representative of our uh, U.S. housing stock. And uh, while we're kind of led to believe that black mold is kind of a rarity, black mold or stachybotrys actually showed up in one third of the homes that HUD had sampled. Um, and worse yet and more alarming, uh, there were eight other toxin-producing molds uh, that showed up in anywhere from 50 to 100 percent of the homes that were sampled. Wow. I mean, th think of that. Um, and, I, and I will say that, you know, when I've presented this information to folks in public health as part of our advocacy work, uh, generally, they're, they're stunned. They, they don't realize that this problem has grown as large as it is or that the toxicity is, is as significant as it is. So basically, you're saying that the vast majority of homes likely have one or more species of mycotoxin producing mold, which is just staggering. And on the subject of mycotoxins, I'll ask you, is there scientific evidence that mycotoxins can affect health? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, as far as the health impacts of mycotoxins go, there is really almost a bottomless well of peer-reviewed research uh, on their health effects. A lot of this stuff comes from the agricultural domain, where the impacts of mycotoxins, like in contaminated feed, uh, have a direct impact on bottom line profits. But before we get to that, um, I think it's worth discussing a little bit about the routes of exposure, um, right? Because there's a lot of emphasis placed on foodborne exposure, uh, which is why the USDA regulates the presence of mycotoxins in some of our food products. Um, but there's somewhat of a reluctance to acknowledge the real risk of indoor mycotoxin exposures from water damaged buildings, uh, which right. I, I say is a, it's a little bit of a ruse. You know, uh, the, the truth of the matter is that when you think about indoor exposure risk, it's probably greater than foodborne exposure, even if you just look from the perspective of routes of exposure. 
Um, you know, indoor indoor exposure is really it's a combination of inhalational exposure, right? As you breathe the stuff in. Um, but then this naturally leads to GI exposure as though you've eaten the stuff, right? Think right. most nasal, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, stuff that ends up in your sinuses will end up in your gut. In addition, when you think about the nature of mycotoxins, they're very small molecules. And most of them, if you look at the research, they're capable of entering our systems uh, right through our skin. Uh, dermal exposure to mycotoxins is, is another legitimate route. So when you, when you think of all of that, obviously, if you're living in an environment where you have mycotoxins, um, all around in the air, in your dust, on your surfaces, um, the potential for the exposure is 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 really really great. Wow, that's staggering. So they don't just enter our bodies through our eating foods that are contaminated with them. They enter through our sinuses, through our skin, uh, many different routes. Wow. And so, what yep. can happen in our bodies when these mycotoxins enter our bodies? Is there evidence about that? Research about that? Yes, indeed. There's a, a very large body of evidence. If you look at mycotoxins as a general class of chemicals, you'll find that they can impact virtually every body system, um, our digestive systems, nervous system, skin, eyes, livers, kidneys, reproductive system, um, you name it. As we've been looking at this, there are really plausible connections to a wide range of our common chronic diseases, um, cancers, autoimmune conditions, neurodegenerative diseases, you know, leaky gut and other GI conditions. Wow. Uh, the Change the Air Foundation, we just recently completed a piece on this called Conception to Grave, which includes 60 or so peer-reviewed references and shows how mycotoxins can be involved in health effects everywhere from fertility and reproductive health all the way to the diseases that we see typically in our elder years uh, that are that are becoming really problematic, Parkinson's, ALZ, um, ALS. And then when you think of things like the gut-brain axis and, uh, you know, potential for neurological involvement, um, you know, a number of these mycotoxins are neurotoxins, which, you know, can certainly set the stage for a whole host of neurolo degenerative neurological conditions. You know. There are plausible connections to pretty much all of that if you, if you look at the effects of mycotoxins and what's established in literature. That is like beyond mind blowing. I mean, this is a huge issue. It seems like it's not getting the attention it deserves. And wh why do you think that might be, David? Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. It is a, uh, it's a massive issue. And it's not it, it's not getting the attention that it deserves. That's really what drives our work at Change the Air Foundation is trying desperately to raise awareness as broadly and quickly as we can, uh, because right now most folks don't have any real understanding of just how serious these health risks of water damage and mold can be particularly from the standpoint of things like mycotoxins and microbial VOCs. So our goal is really to raise awareness. You know, I think there are some things there, there are systemic things that kind of uh, hold us back a little bit. And, you know, as, as you might imagine, a lot of it comes down to, uh, you know, bottom lines and financial interests right. and uh, things like fears of liability. You know, you think about interests such as property development, insurance and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately, they have uh, they have loud voices um, yeah. and are good at getting hurt. And uh, we're we're struggling to kind of shout into the gale, it seems. But uh, we're, we're making some excellent progress. Well, you and I have pretty loud voices and we're going to continue to shout. So uh, the Absolutely. thing is, the thing is, so David, you have been personally affected by mold exposure, you and your wife, right? In terms of the health effects you've been dealing with, just like me. Yes, uh, we've been out of our mold exposure in our house in Vermont since uh, 2017, and we've been treating with some very good specialists uh, around the country as we've been working through 
uh, trying to untangle our version of the illness. You know, my wife has been dealing with ME-CFS or chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, struggling to kind of uh, get that one sorted out. A big factor of this that people should understand, too, is when you're living in water-damaged building, your immune system is really going to take a hit. And that really sets the stage, I think, for a lot of complications when you think of things like secondary infections and things like that. If your immune system is taken out, uh, then the potential health effects, you know, are, are that much worse. And it's, right. it's that kind of thing that really takes treatment with uh, with some really knowledgeable specialists uh, to kind of get to the root of it. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people might might hear this and they might think, oh, wow, that's so, so terrible. I feel so scared and sad about that fact. And one thing I want to put out there is that there's so much you can actually do to reduce your exposure to mycotoxins. And that's a big part of what my channel can help you all do. Thank you, David, so much for joining us and back to the video. Okay, how about that interview, huh? That was eye-opening for sure to me when I heard that information. I wanna be clear that I don't think mold is like the silver bullet and that, oh, this is like the key to every illness on the planet. All I'm saying is that it's one thing that could be contributing to chronic illness more than we realize. If you suspect that you might have mold illness, educate yourself by going to changetheairfoundation.com or changetheairsummit.org. These resources are beyond incredible and a great place to start. If you learned something, please like this video and subscribe for more content that will alert you to things that you need to know about your home and your health. Anyway, my fellow renegades, I salute you.